Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm here with Simon Parks. Hello. Hi, and uh, this is a great opportunity because we were here at the Bases Conference, and here we are at Avebury, which is a, a, an amazing setting, and we just wanted to take the opportunity to talk to Simon a bit. I, I know that everything is, I mean, you've kind of put everything out there, but uh, there was a feeling when I listened to you today, which was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, that there is a lot more, actually, that hasn't even gone out yet, and and your knowledge was was really um, I know it sounds strange, but it was very comforting to me because I rarely hear anyone address the whole sort of black magic side of things and how it it interfaces with this reality, um, like the ET question, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like most people don't bring those two worlds together, and I do. And I've been aware of it for a very, very long time. Um, and I, I'm sure it's because of your, you know, sort of ET contacts that you're aware of this side of things. But I am very interested because, you know, you are dealing with a reptilian race that I have to say, because of your, your, your approach, that you're a positive individual and that they must be positive beings. You know, what I mean, a service to others versus service to self. Sure. And so, um, you know, you have an Illuminati bloodline. I mean, how did you manage to go against the grain the way that you have? Is it simply because of your awareness that was gradually awakened over time? Or do you think that you had sort of that leaning, even as a small child? Um, when you say go against the grain, do you mean uh, my own, perhaps, inbuilt uh, views? Or do you mean the grain of those who are higher than me? Well, higher than you. I'm not sure. Uh, but, yeah, the Illumin when I refer to, you know, the Illuminati bloodline that you're a part of. Because I have free will. Yes. Simply as that. I have free okay. will, and I will choose the course of direction I take, and they may not officially interfere with that. Okay. So even if that goes against their wishes, yes. they just have to live with it. Right. Well, but what I kind of meant by my question was, how did you, as a small child, develop the inner resolve to go in that direction? In other words, a lot of times a child will grow up, will be influenced by parents, grandparents, whatever, to go down a certain path to have certain attitudes. Yes. In, on some level, you had to be rebellious. <laughs> um, no, it's because my soul is not very human. Therefore, it would be wrong to look at me as a child, a five- or six-year-old child, and try to equate that with what a normal earth human child would have. So when you have a very old soul in a very young body, the soul has the knowledge and therefore it was already decided my course of direction was already set. But as a five-year-old child, I couldn't actually articulate that. Right. So the, my brain hadn't yet developed to be able to cope with all the emotions and all the logic. And when I became old enough, then the two would work together. And it's connecting your soul with your mind. Once yes. the two connect, um, that's why it was very important that my body accepted my soul, because in many cases the body won't accept a soul if it's not of an earth human type. Um, so a lot of work was gone in to ensure that I'm very compatible within my, myself. Uh, so it, it wasn't a battle, it wasn't a, a big decision, it was always the way it was going to be. But I had to physically reach a point that could work and be in step with my soul. Okay, and approximately when do you think that happened? Um, it would have been after 1971, which is the um, interaction that I had over two days. So just before my 13th birthday. In terms of your, your inner self, because your world could not have mirrored what you were seeing and what you were learning, right? Mm. Was there any conflict in that way with your, you know, living life in the external world? Or was it because it sounded like maybe your mother, um, for one thing, might have been understanding on some level so maybe uh, there was not much conflict in an external world I mean 
I don't know. You know, I, I can't, um, I don't know what your childhood was like, but uh, did you encounter, you know, did you say things and did other kids make fun of you and, no. you know, this kind of thing? No, because I grew up in what you would call an espionage family with my mother working for MI5. Uh -huh. Most of the people who would come to the house would be uh, men or women 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of age. Right. So therefore, I naturally made friends with these people. The only uh, children of my own age were five girls who lived next door in two families. Um, but most of the con connects I would have would be with adults. And therefore, I would hold a conversation at their level. But I would always talk about world, world politics or economics. Um, that would, would be interesting to me. I wouldn't talk about the alien agenda if they were friends of the family because you, you learn very quickly, I learn very quickly, not to discuss that with anybody outside of an approved group. So what people call handlers, people who were feeding information to my mother for her job, yes. um, then we would discuss or they would have a conversation in front of me and that was perfectly acceptable to be part of that. Um, uh, I wouldn't discuss any of the subject with anybody who wasn't part of the inner circle, part of the family. It's just you wouldn't do it. Okay, so, but you were having these interactions. One assumes that these handler people were not having them. Um, no, that wasn't their job. Their job was purely and simply to um, work with my mother. Uh -huh. My mother's job was to type up documents that were in German related to crashed UFOs that had come down all over the globe. Oh, really? Um, my mother worked for what's called the, the British Secret Service, the BSS, mm -hmm. but MI5. But she was really working for the NSA. Um, but because she, because she was a British subject, of course she had to be managed by British intelligence. Um, so they weren't relating to me, they were relating to the work they were doing with her. Right. But what many researchers found quite incredible was that the discussions they would have with her would be held in front of me. So as a five, six, seven, eight year old child, um, they would hold all these very in-depth conversations with me and I was never asked to leave the room. So I learnt that certain things could be spoken of at certain times and with certain people. Okay. And if they weren't people that were recognised or approved, then I wouldn't discuss anything with them. Okay, when you say recognised or approved, by your mother or by someone else? By, by people coming to the house. So if they came to the house and they were uh, interacted with by my mother, then they were approved. I see. If they didn't come to the house, or they came to the house and they were not clearly um, of a bloodline, or they weren't of a, uh, an intelligent background, then they weren't really to be bothered with. I see. So that's how you'd work it. Uh -huh. And as a child, you learned that very. I learned it very quickly. You could tell from someone's body language. Doesn't matter what what background they are. You know when someone's bloodline. You know um, the type of interactions they have, the way they hold their body, the way they speak. Some men with a bloodline will be incredibly confident. Not mm -hmm. arrogant, just incredibly confident, very, right. very self-assured, mm. um, and um, you know, when you're in the room with somebody who's either um, a sensitive, a psychic, or has other powers, you know immediately, and you just can tell immediately what the person is or who the person is. Okay, uh, so as a young boy, you would see them in this light? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, you, you mentioned your mother. What about your father in these settings? Um, my father left the family when I was about one year old. Oh. <clears throat> so I never saw him again. My mother never had another boyfriend. She didn't remarry. Oh. She said her job was just to bring me up. That was her role. Um, and were you an only child? Yes. You were? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that's an interesting kind of relationship. So you must have been quite close with your mother. Very close. Uh-huh. Yes. So that was somewhat sheltering, I imagine. Protective. Yes. Yes. Okay. The men in your family, was it your grandfather? You said he was in, um, I don't know, he was a high degree Mason, was it? Yes, he was. High uh -huh. degree Mason, British diplomat. Yes. Um, awarded many medals. So did you have a relationship with him? Yes. That... Yes, I would be sent to him for instruction probably every six weeks. Oh, really? So he only lived 12 miles away. Uh -huh. um, so I'd get on, get on a train and go to him and stay a day or two days and then come back. So, when you were young, were you considered something of a, a you know, for lack of another word, uh, idiot savant, or were, were, you know, in other words, did you have abilities that became apparent, obviously, to your mother, such that she treated you in certain ways? No, I, I have dyslexia. Yes. Um, it's very interesting, we were listening to Mary Rodwell, and she was talking about something which I can immediately identify with. Um, people like me are um, altered so that 
an ordinary education system can't reprogram me. Right. So the way I would interact uh, through a standard education system won't work. Um, I was seen as by the established education as they couldn't understand it, why I wasn't very good at maths and why I wasn't very good at English. Yeah, I was a prefect, um, was in the school play, you know, was very well liked. Um, but it was made very clear to me that it was a protection so that I couldn't fall foul of programs which are hidden inside of a university education or inside of any other format. Okay. Uh, and did you go to university? No, I didn't. I wanted to go and get a job. So I went and got a job straight away. I see. So how did you go down this line of politics in relation to your background? In other words, you said sort of like at one point um, that you were kind of selected to, to, to go into a position of power. That was an opportunity for you that you knew that you were going to have. Is it because of that or did you, you know, in other words, how did you kind of get steered? I know you're a counselor and I don't know much about, you know, that, what does that mean in Britain? But, you know, I'm gathering it's political. Yes, it is. It's, I'm elected by the, by the people. Right. Um, so how did you get steered that way? Did you want to go do that? Or? Yeah, I decided that this country wasn't run by the bomb and the bullet. It's run by what they call democracy. And therefore you have to go into politics and be elected to make change. Okay. So I decided that. And when I spoke to my grandfather, the political party I'd chosen, he wasn't supportive of it. Uh, it's a bit like your Republicans and your Democrats. Yes. So he said to me, OK, well, if you're going to support that a lot, I suppose I'd better make you some introductions. So he introduced me to some senior politicians. So did you, do you know people like, uh, I don't know, Tony Blair? Yes. And did you know, I don't know, is Churchill, did he die before you, you did your grandfather know My Churchill? My grandfather met Churchill. Uh -huh. And grandfather used to tell me very funny stories about Churchill. He had a parrot, right. uh, which used to fly around the office. Uh -huh. uh, and was a very I bad language. I had a parrot language. when I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> did, did that. Um, so he knew Duke Churchill. And what my grandfather said of Winston Churchill was that he was a fantastic Prime Minister during the war, but a dreadful Prime Minister in peacetime. Uh -huh. And he saw him as a complete waste of space, but absolutely uh, brilliant for the war. So grandfather would give me a critique of all the different Prime Ministers that he'd met. And he'd ah, I see, yes. So in, in your trajectory, though, with, I mean, kind of to bring it back to your ET connection, yeah. did you, because you, again, you, you were told that, that you could have some kind of position of power. Yes. How was that conveyed to you? Um... At the conference today, I did my talk, and I actually showed one of my drawings, which uh, I, I portray where I have what we call, I call the bargain. Yes. But um, people but be better than I refer to it as an agreement. Yes. So it was an agreement which I understood. I understood the energies behind that agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I accepted it. Um, and so it develops. So you maybe start off with one inch, but you get offered eight inches, nine inches. So what I'm saying to you is that providing you want more, it's given to you, providing you can maintain and hold. And many people can't maintain and hold and they right. collapse or they get corrupted or they right. have a nervous breakdown. As long as you can still maintain, you can advance. Okay. So would you sort of um, assign your advancement in a sense, in politics, in life, to your uh, association with these beings? Would That's that a really interesting accurate? question. I think that, that that would be fair. I've, I'd like to say, through my own abilities, yes. I think I really would, I'd like to say that because I've helped people, you only get elected if people believe in you. Yes. However, I think what, what um, what's called the aliens have done is balance the playing field. In other words, people who might have tried to topple me because of my stance are not in a position to do so. So I would say that what they've done is equal the playing field. Uh, and then it's just down to me. Okay. So in equaling the playing field, you know, because this is very interesting. I'm, I'm looking at the, at the playing field worldwide. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And I'm looking at um, sort of a battle going on here on planet Earth and off the Earth. Yes. And um, I, I'm seeing that there are beings out there, groups of beings, who will do things to sort of facilitate things for for us yes people like us I'm, I'm putting sort of us in the same box so to speak um, I have had interaction with various beings okay. myself um, 
including a flying uh, shikar, uh, which okay. is... Okay, I'm uh, aware of those, yeah. 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 And, um, and, and what I notice is that sometimes you might just say, oh, it's lucky, or it's, you know, you're protected, or, you know, there might be ways of, of referring to this. But I think that there is some kind of, as you say, leveling out or play, uh, balancing out so that the, the negative side can't quite get its hooks or, or whatever you want to call it into you or, or the whatever I, I'll give you an example and I'd like to hear something from your own life along these lines okay. and I'm hoping we're having time for this because okay. we, we have a panel to be a part of um, I don't want to disappoint the people you know no, I understand um, but uh, we myself and my, uh, my ex-partner in Camelot were going up um, a very winding road in the Swiss Alps mm -hmm. in an old car that was a, uh, like an old Audi station wagon, but a very dependable kind of thing. Sure. And um, we, it was checked out with the mechanic before we left, et cetera, et cetera. We got to the very top and we just entered this little parking lot and we're going like less than two miles an hour. And one of the, the wheels of the cars just snapped off and fell. Okay. Okay. It was, we investigated, it was sliced off, um, you know, obviously they, I think they were hoping that it would happen on the way up, and in which case we might have gone off a cliff, sure. you know, in theory. Um, so that's what I'm saying, le leveling the playing field. That would, that would be a moment when you go, well, this is incredibly, you know, a, a stroke of luck, or you could say you're protected, or whatever you want to say about that. Now, in your own life, you must have experienced some kind of close... Yeah, I, I, I tried to cover it a little bit on the conference by saying that um, the attacks I've suffered haven't been officially sanctioned. They've been um, splinter groups, maybe groups of three or four who are not acting under their own instructions, so perhaps with very high level Freemasonry. Um, I had an incident where my car was rammed off the road um, oh, right. at about 60 miles an hour, and the, the young woman with me was actually an employee of... Um, uh, well, a very high-ranking family, and I mentioned her today in, in, in the talk. Uh, the Rothschilds now employ her. She was with the car with me, and okay. we were rammed. Um, and we both remember the vehicle that rammed us appearing to be pushed a hundred uh, yards, almost, almost as if it was on ice, deflected off us. Um, that was very interesting. Oh. So uh, the attacks that I have are not sanctioned at official level, they are small, small uh, groups of people who are very annoyed because sometimes I'll go in and do things that they they personally feel they're losing out on. Okay, but you don't feel obviously that the people that are um, in charge will interfere with you. No, they, they can't. They're not permitted to. It's as simple as that. If you look at look at someone like Alex Collier, and I mentioned that in the talk, yeah, uh, Alex. Um, interacts with creatures at a higher dimension than, than I do and they don't believe in interfering yes so when something bad happens to Alex they believe that it has to be left alone to right. get on with it the creatures I interact with have been interfering in human politics for thousands of years and so it's very easy for them just to come in and get involved so if something was bad was planned to happen to me then they would be a huge interaction and those people who were um, attempting to do something would pay a very heavy price. So how do you, um, you know, I'm not sure if rationalize is the right word, but, but how do you balance this understanding in your own mind? Do you feel, um, is it sort of your personal philosophy that that interference is okay on this level? Or have you been, have, has it been explained to you? In other words, you're saying, you know, sort of higher level beings on a certain level will not interfere yes. and we call that maybe service to others yes. those groups sure. and humans are not even service to others at this point we're service to self or sort of moving into service to others okay. um, the beings that you're sort of working with uh, as you say are, are interfering but how in your mind is that is that okay i mean do you feel that's okay and obviously you may feel protected and safe because of it but does that also make it okay no on it's, a human? A very, it's a very good question first of all from a bloodline if if a person for argument's sake has many thousands of years of a bloodline mm -hmm. then you are associated with a group or with a family and a um a set way of doing things all right uh, again we'll talk about mary's talk um she mentioned 
an ascension. Mm. And she used the term ascension, where certain beings want to ascend and can get on the back of a human ascension. And the situation at the moment is, is very much like a big capital ship that's sinking. And the captain of the ship has got one foot in the big ship that's sinking and one foot in the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering, should he go down with the ship or should he go onto the lifeboat? Right. So um, things are changing. The groups that I uh, are interacting with are taking part in a number of experiments that are taking place on the earth at the moment. And I don't mean physical experiments. To see if the human race can actually live with some of these groups that have oppressed them for thousands of years. And if these groups are capable of saying we no longer see ourselves as the gods of these people. If they can survive and be together, they have a future together. And when the human race actually advances itself, there's a good chance it will take some of these other groups with them. Right. Um, that is the, the experiment that's being played out at the moment at that level. So that's why I'm going with it, because ultimately it could benefit a whole range of people and groups and races. Okay, so, so have the mantis beings and the reptilian beings that you're aligned with, would you say they are, they are um, sort of more service to self or positively oriented as a result of this sort of experiment that you call it? In other words, they see a, they want an ascension path for themselves. Yes. Therefore, they are doing some positive things, having changed, maybe changed their ways. Well, the reptilians have got to change their ritual and their culture if they wish to, to actually advance. Um, that is the problem for them. No, they're, they're service to self. Right. That's their culture. Right. But they have to understand that in order to advance, that has to change. And it mm -hmm. has to genuinely change. They can't just say a few nice words and hope that will happen. Right. They have to actually physically change it. And if they can't, then it won't happen. And they'll be stuck in the fourth dimension for another 10 million years or something like that. The mantids are very keen to evolve. And um, they're looking quite interesting. Now, when you say these, this thing, do you, do you uh, for example, get information from, you know, I interview uh, people that work in black projects who have a background for many, many years working in the secret space program, as we call it. Um, do you have interaction with these kinds of people? Are they giving you information on a more general sort of playing field from the human side? Yes, but they would never, never even, they, they're so careful that... When information is passed to me, it's not done in any way that can be picked up. Um, uh, you wouldn't even know who they were and what they were, mm. because they there's a there's a war going on within their own organisation. Yes, uh, many many splits. Some Very are many. just sick and tired of what's happened, and they want it finished and over with, and the truth out. And there are others who are so deep into it, and others who just don't know any other way to do it and believe that they will be top dog. So because of that, people who wish to be decent uh, have to be incredibly circumspect and very, very careful. Um, and my mother, when she was passed information, she would be literally walking through the park and somebody would just walk past her yes. and drop his umbrella. Right. And she would pick the umbrella up and there would be a note in it. Mm -hmm. That's how the information is genuinely passed secretively. Yes. Now, I assume that you were trained in things like remote viewing, etc. I wasn't. Uh, not trained by humans, no. Not by humans? No. Okay. But you feel you were trained by your, yes. your ET contacts? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And so that you have a, a good sense of telepathy, of, yes. of maybe a pre Because I know you're, you're, a, you're a sensitive. Yes. Yes. Of course you would know this. Yes. Yeah. Um, but but in, in looking at the environment around you, this yeah. ability can really help you. Is it, can it not? I mean, you're, you must be using it constantly, right? I have to be very careful. At home, I have a rule that I'm not allowed to do it when we play any games, card games, anything like that. Uh -huh. my, my children say to me, turn it off, Daddy. Don't use it. Um, when dealing with high-ranking humans, it's absolutely invaluable because I need to know if I'm being lied to. Right. And uh, dealing with aliens, I need to know. I need to yes. know quite what the take is on that. So, yes, it, why I was given it to protect myself and to get to the truth very quickly. In, in dealing with ETs, aliens, visitors, some of whom consider this earth their home, because I've, I've recently in, interviewed uh, a man named Captain Mark Richards, who's in prison okay. in Vacaville. And uh, he's been there for 30 years framed on murder for murder, but he, he's innocent. Um, and 
I did my second interview with him, and he, he talks to the raptors. Okay. Okay, and um, other species as well. Uh, he's had, he grew up in the space program. His father was known as the Dutchman, and he's very well known in, in, in British secret society, Flying apparently. Flying Dutchman. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and he was quite a, a sort of hero in... Mm -hmm. in and so was his son, actually, the, the one who's in prison. But they were afraid he was going to, I guess, turn on them and talk. And yes. ha he has a substantial number of enemies. Um, but in dealing, he's talked to me, and he's actually writing reports now, because he's, I guess he's frustrated that he's been stuck in prison all these years. Yeah, I'm and, sure. And wants to change yeah, sure. the playing field, so to speak. Yeah. Um, he could go off planet and leave in a minute, but he... He wants to stay here. He wants to work on this situation, but he also, I think, is you know, great deal of love for his wife and his family, and so okay. he wants to stay here with them. Uh, but in your experience, are you dealing with a lot of ETs? Are you going to meetings, for example, that we are told happen uh, between various races here on the planet? Are you able to talk about that? Um, I don't necessarily go in this this body. Uh huh. But you do go. Yes. So, in taking part in a, in a meeting such as that, would you say things are going well? Or are they, is, are they like negotiations in the Middle East where, you know, one day it's on and the next day it's off? I mean... You can't do that with aliens. You can't, you can't break an agreement. You're given... Once you make an agreement, you keep to it. If you don't, you have trouble. Um, the difficulty is humans having the understanding to deliver what is required. In other words, if um, a particular group of humans wishes to murder half of the planet, we can't go along with that. Right. So one has to contact those people in the military who are not prepared to be pushed around like that. And they have to have the strength and knowledge to be able to take that action. And sometimes you need to shore that up. Because it is the humans who have to be their own 7th Cavalry. You know, it, humans are always looking for somebody to come and assist them and help them. Where's Custer? Right. Where's the Seventh Cavalry? The human race is the Seventh Cavalry. And so, as I said, it's about levelling the playing field, and then the human race has to then deliver the change itself. In terms of meetings, it's literally about um, saying how far a group can go. To? Mm, a course of action. Oh, to, to affect change or yes. to do something here on the planet that will yes. then interfere with the you timeline? Have to, you or... have to understand that, that, that President Putin is now interacting with a different form of aliens than, than, than Obama is interacting with. The Chinese are also split. Yes. Um, and uh, Iran is now becoming split as well. Right. So it's not clear cut as it was 10 years ago. Um, different groups uh, believe they're top dog because they are being advised by their own groups. So it's not straightforward. And some of those groupings are just running for their own goal. They're not part of a, of a wider uh, federation or a wider grouping. Um, uh, so I'm quite supportive of Putin at the moment. Okay. Now, I, I've been told by that, uh, that, that, that the Russians are, are, though, mainly working with a group of, of uh, reptilians. This is what I've been told. Uh, they were. Uh -huh. They were. But they're do you think now, there's another group they They're got? now working with a much more humanoid group at the moment and that's why Russia doesn't buy oil in dollars anymore I've, I've heard that the for example um, the Chinese are very closely aligned with the Zetas and have been for many many years and then that I have a, a whistleblower who t told me that they're they have gotten in contact with a completely different race that's yes. like a new race yes and is not liked by most of the other races yes. because of their not part of the club. Yeah. That's correct. Absolutely uh, right. Yeah. Do we need to make a move now? Yeah. No. I don't know. <laughs> so we should. Okay, yeah, we probably okay. should. Okay, well, uh, this has been fascinating, and I want to thank you very much for, fine. It's a pleasure. for doing this and, 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 and meeting with me and, and making That's this fine. all possible. That's good. Um, and, uh, That's fine. We'll maybe do some more tomorrow. We'll see how we go. That'd be great. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and we're doing a second segment with uh, Simon Parks here today. Uh, we were in a very interesting environment yesterday in Avebury. Today we're here at um, a back room in the, in the complex where we're, we're doing the 
Bases conference, and, and we've both been, I'm about to speak later today, and he's, he spoke yesterday, and I must say that his, I believe your, your uh, a video of what you said yesterday will be available on probably the, the Bases conference site as time goes on. I'm sure Miles Johnston is going to make that available for people. And I, I just have to say, again, I know I've already told you this, but I think it's, it was excellent. You know, you really, it's, it's certain, a certain angle that you took on things that was quite comprehensive, but at the same time was very specific in certain areas, and I thought key areas that people need to hear and need to put together. Because you don't often get someone talking about the ET reality, um, also the political reality on Earth, as well as the, uh, the idea of, of what's going on with Satanism, uh, the Illuminati, and sort of putting all of that package together is, is not an easy task, I think, for especially people re relatively new to the subject. But even long-term people in this area, they simply never touch on uh, what's really motivating the Illuminati to do what they do, and the reptilians to be the way they are therefore also motivating the Illuminati who are, have their bloodline and so on. And um, so I think that's, that's really important. Thank you. Um, it is a difficult subject to bring up. And if you go into it in too great a detail, you turn people off. Yes. If you don't do it in enough detail, people are left with too many questions. Yes. So it's rather like that guy who walked the tightrope across the Niagara Falls. You have to walk a tightrope and you have to look at your audience. Mm -hmm. and decide whether they can take any more or whether they can't. That's right. And it was quite a switched on audience last night, so mm -hmm. I could push it a little bit further than I might have done. But thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely a skill, and obviously you are a public speaker, having gotten to the position as a counselor. Yes. Correct? So, uh, so that's a, a, an incredible asset to have in, in a situation such as this, where you've got somebody who is, you know, a unique combination. Uh, really, and and um, I'm glad that we have this sort of, you know, <laughs> package in in a sort of disclosure witness, if you will, because this is disclosure. I mean, this is an ongoing disclosure. I don't know, and this is actually a good question for you. Um, have you been given sort of the okay from a certain group? Because you talked about that schism going on behind the power powers that be, so to speak. Um, where one side is just fed up and really wants a change and doesn't want to be sort of under the, the rule of the reptilian faction. And um, is, is that, are they sort of backing you in this, do you feel? <clears throat> Nobody's literally put their cards on the table. That would be too dangerous. Okay. So there have been um, indications given. Um, I did mention the birthday card, and I have made reference to that before. That is a tacit approval, you know, go on, we know what you're doing. To be invited to the radar base is another tacit oh, approval. Oh, yes. Um, and the protection that I'm afforded, that's obviously an approval. But nobody has actually sat down and said, go for it, we, we support you 100%, because they just haven't got the authority to do that. Now, the, actually, that's an interesting uh, sort of angle, because I was fascinated by the radar base, base uh, sort of thing you talked about, and I wondered if that's men with Hill. Are you able to say? No, it's, there are three very, very secure bases in Britain. One is GCHQ, which right. is equal to your uh, NSA's uh, office. Mm -hmm. And the other one is men with Hills, which is a listening post. Yeah. But this one is a space radar base, which is filing days. And that okay. is run by America, but it's based in Britain. Okay, so the name of it actually um, is filing. Okay, exactly. I thought perhaps that was, I don't know. Uh, it's the name of the village, and they've just taken the name of the village and I added it to the base. And whereabouts in Britain is that, just it's out of It's about curious. 12 miles from where I live. Is in that? North Yorkshire, in England. North, oh, north in the north, England. in the north. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it's looking across to Germany, basically. It's across the, the North Sea. Really? Yeah. Hmm, okay. That's, that's interesting as well. Uh, all right, well, you know, the triangular structure that you said, it, you said it was constructed back in the 1950s? No, it was actually built in 1963, but the first facility was an analog radar. Okay. It was consisting of three balls 
and they were called right. golf balls for a joke because that's what they looked like. And then when they moved from analog to digital, this was the pyramid that replaced it. It's a, a three-phased array. So it's three phases of a digital radar which go out into space right. and uh, cover about three quarters of the Earth, literally. Um, officially, the radar goes out to between six and 12,000 miles. Unofficially, it's about 26,000 miles. Now, you know that, there, that Men With Hill would have a similar uh, structure, it seems. However, they seem to have these golf ball, whatever yes. you call it, shapes instead, yes. um, which is kind of interesting. Is there something, I mean, obviously, maybe you can't answer this. I don't even know if you have, you know, sort of the scientific background or, or whatever. But is there something that these round golf ball shapes cover that the other one doesn't? Um, well, they're different, different roles. Yes. Men with Hills is listening. It's covert, it listens, it picks up signals, mm -hmm. either on a passive or an active way. The actual panels that make up the golf balls can be triangular panels that all fit together. Uh, it's about focusing electronic energy, whether it's a radio signal or um, some sort of phased signal. So it allows it to be focused into the receivers that are inside. So you're absolutely right, that circular shape um, doesn't allow frequencies to bounce off the surface, they should be absorbed through the surface. So it's not ascending? So that, no, 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 men with hills, men with hills is purely receiving, it's spying on radio frequencies from, from all over the world. Right, but um, I have to say I've had a, a secret witness disclose information to me about men with hill. Okay. And one of the things that they told us was um, that there is a, a, a portal, a time travel jump gate, maybe you might call it, mm -hmm. there. So they're doing a lot more than just listening. Yeah, the, the base literally does that. It, it listens to whatever is going on. Right. But what you would do if you were the military is you would set up one of your bases on a piece of land that you don't want anyone else to access. Right. That's the point of it. So if you have a, a, a stargate or a portal, you need to buy the land so that no one else can have access. Sure. You stick a military base on it, which means you can put a 12-foot fence around it, you can yes. have it. That's actually why it's there, to protect in a covert way, but it does do a listening job, it really right. does. It, it's, it signals, it's signet. It works very closely with, with the Americans. Yes. But it is also acting as the first form of defense to keep people out. So yes, I absolutely agree with you. Okay, now do you have a political position in regard to the idea that, because I've heard you reference, it's very interesting to me, because you're referencing the American role a lot. Yes. And I'm very aware that GCHQ, for example, is basically, you know, hand in hand with the NSA. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I believe, in the public domain. I think you can actually research articles that have been written basically okay. saying, you know, I mean, really talking about their business relationship, which okay. is substantial. Uh, but I have gotten back channel information about that as well. But what I what interests me is that you know because I we see the city of London and and we we've gotten witnesses who've taken part in meetings there, which are definitely meetings of sort of the Illuminati, the groups they may you know have flown in from anywhere really in, in the world, sure. um, and there will be Americans there no doubt. But the English are very much you know, involved, and they are very much, I mean, I'm sure, you know, I actually just, as I said, interviewed Mark Richards, and he said um, that there's actually four countries that are working in the secret space program and running it, so to speak. Uh, he did say the United States was taking the lead. He said the United States and Russia, as a matter of fact. And then he said Britain and France kind of are close seconds, and I think somehow Germany factors in there. Now, this, I mean, because again, your sort of slant is to say the Americans, the Americans, and I'm, I just wanted to sort of balance it out a bit and, and ask you, is it a political sort of statement in, on your part? Are you sort of, I don't know, you know, on a British sense saying, why are these Americans sort of in here meddling in our affairs? Or are you totally sort of understanding the relationship and feeling, because there have actually been television series in, in Britain that I've watched that I think are quite fun because they're, they sort of poke fun at the American-British relationship behind the scenes in the covert world. You're making me smile. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's the fact that America has the final say. Okay. That's the point. Really? The, 
whatever arrangements, whichever countries, which whoever is around the table, the chairman will always be American. And therefore the Americans will have, excuse me, <coughs> the Americans will have the final say. And not necessarily because they're paying for it all, but because there is an arrangement and agreement that the Americans will have the final carte blanche. Now why is that? Because, going back to the Operation Paperclip, when all the Nazi scientists were, well not all of them, but most of them, um, the Americans put themselves in a tremendous leap ahead and got all the other major countries together to sign an agreement that America would act on their behalf. And when alien intervention officially occurred, it was with the American government. So all other Earth governments um, in the 50s and 60s had to bow to the Americans because they had been chosen as the government to represent the world. So on the physical aspect, you had um, America controlling technology through German scientists, freezing out other countries from that, so they kept their, their position. And then from the ET perspective, the ETs then dealt with America. So it was a fait accompli. It was clearly um, America's right, as they were seen by other countries, to lead. And what America did was do things like tie the price of oil to the dollar and many other things. You mentioned Britain. The, the British don't have any say, really, in the military side, but they do because of the Queen and because of the money. So because of that, it is seen as politic to consult the British um, if you have some questions which um, have an effect across borders. You would always consult the Illuminati element of Britain because you want their agreement. It's very much like you don't actually need it, but it's part of the ceremony yes. to get the stamp of approval from the royal side of Britain because then you are keeping your family together. And many and many times in the meetings, eyebrows go up and it's, oh my God, we've got to consult the British. <laughs> we better speak to the British. Don't do this without getting the okay from the British. That's often the way it is. And it doesn't mean the people on the table don't actually get on. They have a very close working relationship. Yes. But the attitude always is that the Americans call the shots. And in recent days, we're seeing that being challenged. And that's what's making them very, very uneasy. Okay, now there is, uh, speaking of this challenge, uh, there is some, uh, well, let's say a remote viewer that I worked with. And I do some remote viewing myself, but this is an expert remote viewer. And I worked with him behind the scenes, uh, looking at Sandy Hook, and, um, and what went on behind the scenes of Sandy Hook, and what the symbolism was. And every time there's a false flag, there's, there's substantial symbolism that's you know, totally you know, Illuminati, Satanic, and so on. And, you know, Jordan Maxwell, for example, is an expert in this area and uh, interviewed him and he's actually uh, become a good friend. Uh, so, gone down that rabbit hole and basically what we see is that Sandy Hook had uh, sort of, um, you'd say, ripples going out into the banking world. As, and there's, a, there's another false flag, which was, I think, the Boston one that also had had folded in there, which was some kind of challenge on the banking level that was said that it's possible that that was actually a, a hit on American soil by the British, by an element of the Brits or the Illuminati, basically kind of saying, you know, we are here and you can't, you know, screw with us. I was going to use a different word. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that kind of thing. Now, do you know anything about that sort of thing? Yes, that's, that's part of the game. It's not a game, but that's the way it seems. Yes. When the Pentagon was supposedly hit, um, the part of the Pentagon that was taken out belonged to the Navy. Right. And at that time, the Navy had been pushing to expand its control of alien technology in the space program. Mm -hmm. The Navy, right back to Forrestal in the 50s, had always had a key role within the armed forces of America and jealously guarded it and didn't want to let go and, and started to expand their control. Mm -hmm. So that was a warning from one arm of America to the other arm. And the Brits um, would attempt to do something but only if they feel they're on very strong ground. So if there's a groundswell of opinion within the organisation um, and there's one or two people holding them back, you can't take those people out. But what you do is you use a, you're calling it a false flag, you use a situation which hits the buttons from 
the false flag perspective, but within that we have a saying in Britain which is kill two birds with one stone. But within that is an attack upon a particular element and it's a warning, it's not just as a warning. These, these games go on all the time Yes. and it's, it's part of the game because I'll do it to you on Tuesday, you'll do it to me on Thursday. Right. Um, but you never overstep the mark. Right. Um, yes. And finally, uh, in magic, you have to tell people what you're going to do, otherwise it doesn't take effect, it doesn't root, mm -hmm. and you have to do it in a way that most people don't see and understand it. And I think, wasn't it with Boston, that was a, one of the Homer Simpson cartoons, mm -hmm. where there was a, one of the, the cartoons talked about an explosion and he made a joke about it, and that was before it occurred. Yes. So, so their friends in the, the film industry will drop these um, very timely notes but most people won't pick them up. Exactly. Now, one thing along those lines, actually, uh, I, I see, because I came from the film industry, I don't know if you know my background. Uh, no, not at all. Yeah, I, no. I spent 19 years working in Hollywood, okay. um, you know, on, at the top levels, uh, working, you know, as an executive assistant, and then I worked my way up to doing development and basically trying to push the glass ceiling and, and put projects together and, and in, became an independent producer and so on. Um, although I never got my sci-fi movies off the ground, and so this is how I ended up as a documentary filmmaker, okay. revealing the truth in Camelot, is, is kind of a funny trajectory. But at any rate, um, what happens with, with that is there is a seeding, as we, we call it in Hollywood, of information, and that will then set the scene, so to speak, for the Illuminati to then, as you say, uh, carry out a magical act. And I reference it this way as well. And, um, and, and people have to be notified, it's, you know, to cast this, you know, spell or whatever you want to call it. Um, it is interesting, though, it happens years in advance sometimes, and you may be aware of that as well, right? So that we've been, movies now are being seeded with information, and even for the last few years, that is telling us some of their plans or perspective you know, agendas, so to speak, playing out in certain ways, even um, troubleshooting those, those agendas yes. in a sort of a, a movie scenario, and then actually doing them. Yes, absolutely. And then covering their bases. Test, testing it out, it's no different from a pilot who wants to fly a, a big jumbo jet aircraft, he or she will go on a simulator. Yes. So you use films as yes. a simulator. Yes. Um, and you see what the feedback is, and you'll have magical groups or sessions who will look at that and have focus groups, they're very, very in route, to see if it's bedded into the future. And then there's another department which will scan the future to see if that took effect. If it did, did it have the effect that was required? And the effect that's required is always to put America on the best timeline. That is the whole point of it, to keep America on the most um, useful timeline for America. And within that we mean the group that run America. Okay, and do you want to talk a little bit about the group? I mean, we're talking, I, when we reference it, we say the Bush Cabal. Um, but do you have any more specifics than that? Hmm. Because there is something of, of, a, of, a, of a factionalization going on in America, and certainly I can tell you that, you know, we're aware of in the armed services, the various uh, services, as you say, the Navy, um, there's a very specific part of the Navy that are, from what I understand, the good guys, so to speak. There's another part of the Navy that may not be on board in quite that way. What, you know, and when I say the good guys, I'm talking about working sort of at least on behalf of humanity and not wanting to you know, eliminate two-thirds of the population on the planet, etc. So they're not on board with that kind of an agenda. But... There are, and I have been told, there are different, for the Army is, is, is working with one group of ETs, the Navy with another, the Air Force another, you know, and so on and so forth. Are you aware of this? Yes, there's one overall ET group from a political perspective. But the individual military arms have aligned themselves with ET groups that would or do work in their specific technology range. So if you're at the moment uh, a Navy man, you're looking at how do you camouflage your ships to make them visible to radar. There's a, a recent craft called the Zomwalt, it's a Zomwalt class, and we're talking about uh, Illuminati jokes and magic. 
The captain of that is James T. Kirk, and there's no, that's deliberate, they've done that. So there's an alien group that will give them or help them to develop technology which allows them to be almost camouflaged, mm -hmm. very useful for high-sided ships. So that's what the Navy would be into. Um, we've had a long time with stealth technology, and um, there are other forms of powering an aircraft now which they're looking at. So different alien groups, it isn't that they, they specialise, they are prepared to offer that particular technology. And so what you tend to find is that the different military groups will do that. But within the army, there isn't just one alien group. You'll have several special departments within the army with their own groups. And sometimes they will bring advisors in who will come in and just almost like chair a meeting, for want of a better word, and arbitrate between two or three groups they may be arguing. Sure. So it, it's, it's really dynamic. It's rather like the United Nations in that sense of the word. Um, and I think even many researchers, not you because you're incredibly knowledgeable, but there are many researchers who uh, don't realise just how complex this is and frankly they would be pretty, even they would be scared because they believe, many researchers believe they have a handle on it. Yeah. They think they've got it encapsulated in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a bubble. It's, it's not like that at all. Right. Um, okay. Uh, now, I have a couple people that, uh, at least one person, who gave me questions for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, you know, people are coming up to me, they're aware I'm interviewing you, so they're the ones here. Okay. And they're quite excited about it, um, for, for what it's worth. And uh, one of the people wanted to know this question, and I thought it was quite an interesting question. Um, he wanted to know if, um, what is the relationship of the mantids to the Atlanteans and the Lemurians. Hmm. Okay. We, we need to bring in Hollow Earth. Immediately you say that. Um, it's not widely understood that the Mantids actually have a very, very strong connection to the Earth planet. A very strong connection. Um, and have... Interfered is probably not the right word. But have been around during previous civilizations uh, in a not so much giving technology, but in trying to steer in terms of um, spirituality, trying to attempt to stop humanity making the mistakes it's made before, but in such a way as it's not actually uh, treating humanity as a, as a cattle that's being pushed through lots of gates, attempting to give free will. Um, and what the mantis have done is establish safe havens in the earth for groups who are semi-dormant, which at some point will, will come around and take part. So the, the mantis have been given the right by other groups to hold this role. And I, I've often referred to it you know, in a soccer game as the referee. That's the role the mantis play, as a referee. And because of their long association, which is not questioned by any group, with the humankind and the planet Earth, they have the right to be involved, they have the right to make decisions, which other alien groups may not like, but are going to have to be to be abide by. And many of those decisions the mantis make are beneficial to the humankind, and sometimes go against the bigger agenda that some other alien groups have. So um, I don't really want to talk about the Ukraine situation here in this building, but for instance, the mantis who very, very would have been incredibly unhappy had the Ukraine situation gone in any other way. So the situation that occurred was probably the best outcome uh, under the terms. So... Okay, but, well, okay, this, this doesn't quite answer the question that I asked, but I, I do want to kind of pursue this line of, of questioning anyway, because you brought it up, um, okay. and, and it's, it's a very interesting situation, obviously. Um, and I have some information also to ask you about, but... The Ukraine is, is at war now, and um, it's, it's not clear uh, really what the outcome is. And some people would say that this is, um, well, they're certainly trying to, to, to use that as a, as a jump start for a World War III. So what outcome at the, in the Ukraine are you saying is preferable that's actually happening now? Because the airplane that crashed in Ukraine was destined to crash somewhere else. Okay, um, that's a very loaded statement, but it did, you're saying there, it, well, because, you know, there are all kinds of stuff in the internet, of course, 
And um, this information is, yes, a, a plane crashed. Now, where was it headed for? Are you able to say? I think we know it was headed for Kuala Lumpur. And the object was that it wasn't ever going to leave Kuala Lumpur. And it was much better for it to um, have a, a nasty situation where it did than Kuala Lumpur. But that was the official destination. Okay. The plane was diverted in real time to head for one of the proper Russian cities to make a crash landing. Really? And then when that was discovered, it was brought down before it entered what? is proper Russian territory. So that means that it, in a, it sounds as though uh, the Russians would have shot it down. They absolutely did. Okay. Um, and in other words, under Putin's direction, absolutely. in theory. Absolutely. Um, if it was headed for Kuala Lumpur, why shouldn't it have arrived? Um, well, that's what its destination was, was originally for that. So right. it's changed. But why... Um, okay, so it was just redirected, but why... Why was it redirected toward that Russian city? I mean, was it, did it have something to do with who was on board? Was this a, a last minute decision? It was, it was a last minute decision in, set in the terms they didn't want to let anybody else know what they were doing. So the longer you leave a decision, the less chance the other side has to react to it. Right. So the pilots of the plane didn't actually know. They were just told to redirect. Um, I don't use the word dirty bomb but along those lines. So in the same way as you guys had to put up with 9-11, Mossad had a very big role to play with that, so Mossad had a very big role to play in this one. Right. Um, and the contents of the cargo bay, um, which have gone all over this Russian city. Okay, uh, well then, so it still was the purpose, in other words, you're saying it sort of had a failed purpose, but ultimately, They've kind of tried to drum it up anyway into a useful, in other words, the Mossad and, 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 and various, well, the press being used as a, you know, bird dog in the sense, as it maybe always is. Um, you know, in other words, this plane still caused the havoc, some havoc in this way, and they're sort of moving it into this idea that there's an escalation, right? And... Putin is being blamed, you know, um, but not for the reasons you're saying, which is interesting, you know, in other words, a defensive move, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Um, and, and there's also been a lot of discussion about Flight 370 mm -hmm. and the relationship between the flights and the dead bodies that were supposedly on there and so on and so forth. Because if this plane was going to Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. um, it was Flight 370, it would sound like, but used for a different purpose. Uh, I think people are, with the first Malaysian flight that went missing, people are very clear of the group of 19 or 20 Chinese scientists who were there. That's fairly well known. Yes. Working uh, for an American company, uh, working on stealth technology, and with the change, of, with the demise, the pattern then goes to um, Jacob Rothschild. Yes. That's well known, or it should be. What isn't well known is there was also another group of scientists. They got all the group of scientists together who were genetic scientists, biological weapon scientists. Uh -huh. They were also on the plane. Right. Now, I don't know if you've seen any of the somewhat submerged reports from the um, uh, rebel commanders on the ground, but a number of the bodies that they found were tortured. Okay, okay. yes. The, um, I think also it's probably well known somewhere on the internet that a number of the bodies were long dead. Yes. Long dead. What's less well known is that blood supplies were also being kept and they were containing a very nasty virus. I see. Um, Mossad had a bomb in the... I said I wouldn't talk about it, but you know, I'll tell you now. Mossad had a bomb, uh, bomb in the hold. Yes. And the object was to detonate that, to mm. spread the contents far and wide. That is why it wasn't taken out with a missile. Because the last thing you want is an aeroplane exploding at 20,000 feet and pushing all its bits all over the place. Right. It's brought down by cannon fire. Because cannon fire aimed at the cockpit of the aircraft would disable the pilots. So the aircraft just goes into an immediate tailspin and crashes on the ground. It does not explode in the air. And therefore, you contain within a much smaller distance the contamination. And that is why international observers weren't allowed 
anywhere near that aeroplane from I see. Those, so that they could be contained and the bodies that they wanted to get rid of got rid of. And the real genuine people who'd been dead just that moment, they were obviously given back to the loved ones. So a clean-up operation took place. Um, well, there is an airplane expert who also did go on the internet, um, assuming his information is correct, saying that there were also bullet holes coming from within the airplane uh, going outwards on the hull, from, on the front part of the I'm not, I'm not familiar with that carrier. I'm, I'm familiar with the, the, the type of aircraft that shot down um, that, that aircraft has two sorts of cannon rounds. Okay. Um, I don't think the Americans use it. The, the Russians have a, a depleted uranium round, which is then followed by a high explosive round, followed by a depleted uranium round. So it fires boom, 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 boom. Depleted uranium, high explosive. Depleted uranium, high explosive. And those were fired into the cockpit, and that's the equivalent, as a friend of mine once described it, as like a hand grenade going. So it would immediately incapacitate the pilot, the co-pilot, and the radio operator, and the navigator immediately. They'd be dead within just a second, two seconds. Right. So it was designed to take out the command and control of the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of any small arms fire, because all aircraft now have very strong doors, and I would find it very hard to imagine a handgun being able to penetrate the door that seals the, the pilot's cabin from the passengers. The whole object is to make these doors bullet resistant. Um, if we're saying that there was a possibility of a firefight inside the cockpit, um, that would mean that you'd place an agent on board. Um, that seems a very unlikely thing to happen because if you're firing in a pressurised cabin at 30,000 feet, how on earth are you going to take control of the aeroplane? Right. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I am knowledgeable of the cannon rounds that were fired from one angle mm -hmm. and then the second angle. Right. And the aeroplane was being escorted by two Ukrainian fighters. Mm -hmm. The Russians launched ground-to-air missiles, not at the aeroplane, but to chase off the fighters. The fighters broke and peeled away as the ground-to-air missiles went at them. That allowed the, the Russian aircraft to intercept the aeroplane without fear of engaging the Ukrainian fighters, and then the cannon was fired. Was the Russian them. aircraft uh, stealth? No, it didn't need to be. Because I haven't heard a report of a, I've heard about the fighters, I, I don't think I've heard about the other aircraft. No, because if you hear about that, then you have, as a member of the public, then you're putting out information that would implicate the Russian government, and the Americans are not going to do that. Um. The Americans are not going to implicate the Russians in any shape or form, because they are operating on some level together anyway. Right. And so the last thing they're going to do is that, because then the Americans then would have to ratchet up the situation. And they don't want to do that. Okay, well then describe, since we're on the subject, the, the relationship with the Mossad. Because the Mossad is, you know, we're talking about Israel wanting, uh, you know, a war, I guess. No, we're not. We're not talking about Israel wanting a war. We're talking about an elite group of people who are Jewish within Israel who want a war. Yes. So it's not... Okay, well, fair enough. Yeah, we've got to yeah. be very careful. We yeah, no, that's I'm, fair I'm, enough. I'm actually Jew myself. Yeah. Um, we have to... Ensure it's like when people talk about the reptiles and say, Well, which reptiles are you talking about? Right. You know, let's be specific here. Yes. We're talking about an elite group of people who have always been used by groups of Americans to undertake incredibly difficult and honest jobs that nobody else on the planet would undertake. Right. The reason the, the, this group of um, Israelis have this protection is because they have, for a very long time, had very close connections with an off world group um, who protect them. Um, and advise them. Mm -hmm. And that's known by America. And America does not have access to this same group. And that is why America treats um, the Israeli nation with great respect. And that's why the Israelis can almost get away with anything. Because nobody wants to push it to the nth degree. Okay. And this group, uh, you know, I, I've heard other interviews you've done, and you don't seem to refer to this group as the Anunnaki. Is, you know, which it seems that they would be, and and I don't know, you know, that's just a label, and I, I know the whole history. I, I go with that. Label. I'm quite happy to go with that. You're happy to go. To, okay. I'm happy to go with that label. Yeah, because it seems to me, you know, I mean, just for lack, of, you know, that's sort of the popular name yes. that they go by. Now I don't know the. We're looking at we're looking at a, a, a you know, you, you Americans will know the Ancient Aliens TV series. We we did get it in this country, but it didn't make the hit here. It did with you guys. But we are looking at a group of, from, from interaction with Sumeria, from Babylon. Yeah. That is the group um, 
through the Mesopotamian bloodlines. I mean, my human father was Iranian. Mm. He was actually an Iranian Persian Jew, and he can, interesting combination. Yeah, he can trace a bloodline right back to Sumerian times. Mm -hmm. And so this is the group that most certainly would yes. not let go of the Israeli nation because they see them as the chosen race, and that is exactly where it comes from. Yes. Okay. Um, well, and they are depicted on the, the reliefs on temples, etc. Um, we're talking about uh, in Sumeria, also, you know, uh, in, in, in Iran, yes. there's some gorgeous uh, art yes. that has, has been made uh, uh, depicting these beings who are humanoid. Yes, my grandfather was actually invited in his role as a British diplomat to go to Persopolis oh. in Persia and was given a tour. Yes. Um, with other British diplomats around Persopolis, and I've lost them now, but he gave me some lovely photos, very poor quality. But um, before the reliefs were all cleaned, they've all been cleaned and restored now. Yes. And some of the winged beings. Um, Extraordinary. Yes, and he did say to me, I think he went in 56, 1956, and he said to me, um, what a magical place, what a, what a powerful place, the center of a great nation, um, and revered to this day. Um, you know, and he said to me, actually, if there was ever a war in the area, then it would never be bombed. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I saw an exhibit at, at the Louvre, actually. Yeah. Um, extraordinary. Just, you know, stunning. Uh, okay. Um, and I took some photographs okay. uh, of them, uh, so I could maybe put one on here so that people can see what we're talking about. One of the people that asked the question is asking it because of a disclosure witness that we have behind the scenes okay. um, that we published a report from. And I guess the witness had, or the person had, had read the witness's report and wanted to follow this line of sort of inquiry that this had been put in the report that talked about uh, the Atlanteans still being around at this time and the, and the Lemurians and that there is, again, to go back to the mantids, what is the relationship? I think it's you know, a very general question because to my way of thinking, uh, you know, the Atlanteans, we are the Atlanteans from my point of view and many of us have reincarnated from there and that's part of the drama we're going through here on planet Earth is sort of reliving from a different viewpoint a lot of those, the things that went down during those days. But, Aside from that, Atlant Atlantis was just like now. We have so many different uh, races, different groups. Um, so who, what kind of relationship? To say a relationship to the Atlanteans is a huge population. But does that make any sense? Because I know there's also sort of an elitist group here on the planet that relates to themselves as the Atlanteans. I think they mean the ruling class of the Atlanteans. Right. Um, it, it, it's... It's like walking through a fog. The group that's running the world now, n not Lumerians or Atlanteans, not at all, they are the ones who see themselves as beyond being involved. They see themselves as incredibly educated, very knowledgeable, the holders of magic, the holders of power, the holders of the keys. Um, and they are interacted with on the fringes by the very nuts and bolts 3D type people who are running, running the world. Mm -hmm. Civilizations are never totally destroyed. They are preserved in some method, in some way. You're referring to souls that reincarnate, yes indeed. Um, and we talk about the hollow earth. I've never, I've never agreed to a hollow planet, but I have agreed to caverns and areas where cities exist in the third dimension and in the fourth dimension held within the planet. Mm -hmm. Those people who have come from uh, cities from the past, who have an expertise and a knowledge which is not acceptable now, but will be if the earth changes its values, the human race changes its values. These people can come out of hiding and then can be part of the regeneration process to take place. So the, the mantis have preserved a line and protected groups right through history, ready for a time when they may or may not be available. So yes, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and if anything, hopefully people have learned that greed, avarice, the, the desire to have weapons, the desire for power, destroys great civilizations.
Mm-hmm. That's what destroyed these places, because their uh, love was outstripped by their demand for knowledge, which then became the demand for power and became all corrupting. So if we learn anything from that, you can go forward and create another wonderful civilization, but not fall into the traps that made before. And we're afraid that the human race at the moment does need a referee. It needs somebody to say, um, not tell it what to do, but to say, here's the advice. If you choose that advice, that's fine. But if you don't, then you live by it. So I found the question you asked to be very general, and I have a problem with general questions. Yes. Um, when it's a general question, then find out how to ask that. But, I've tried to be a bit more specific within that general question, so I hope that whoever asked that um, would find that that was perhaps a good answer for them. All right, yeah, that, that's, you know, a bit better. Um, if, you know, it, it's all, all in how you frame the question. I think that there was a sort of, it, it's a bit sort of a simplistic question um, because of the complexity, but it is interesting. Um, all right, so uh, let me see. If I can remember, there's one other question that I was asked. Uh, it's about, um, gosh, I'm not, I, I don't think I can remember quite the name of it. Maybe it'll come to me. Um, well, if you I just haven't. try some of it, maybe I'll know the rest, right? Okay, uh, Fabian Society, uh, Fabian Society, it's yeah. either got a V or a B, Fabian, Fabian Society. Yeah. Um, the person wants to know, I guess, are you a member of it? Are you aware of it? Hmm. I'm not a member of it. Um, it's always been the intellectual arm of a, what the media would like to call a left thinking think tank. Um, some very great craftsmen like um, a guy called Morris, who uh, between 1897 and 1900 created the Art Nouveau movement, um, created arts and crafts. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a member of that. You have some very interesting writers and it's tended to be the intellectuals who have gone to that um, and they've been used by the major political party, the Labour Party, to bounce ideas off on an intellectual level. Mm. Um, the relationship between the Labour Party and the Fabian Society, as it's actually correctly called, is not always good because one side has pure thought and the other side is, well, how can we make that possibly work in a 3D world? No, I'm not part of it. I haven't been invited. If I was invited, I would join. Okay. Uh, well, I think this person also went on to say that there is something, um, I think a particular individual who came out of that party, or maybe even created it, um, that, or society, that um, what, he, what, what he was known for was uh, taking very small steps to gain power. Okay. You familiar with that concept? Mm-hmm. I mean, as in relation to that society, mm-hmm. do you, you know, it being a philosophy of theirs or something. Um, well, the Illuminati do it, don't they, all the time? They certainly do. Because if you you do it in too big a step, you you get called out. Well, the and I think just to to go further down that the questioning line there, uh, I think that they were intimating that perhaps that was your technique. Because they were saying that you are, well, you're a counselor, right? And it seems that in theory, you're being groomed for something or you're grooming yourself for something, however you want to sort of term it. And that you're going rather slowly towards that goal. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. And that maybe this is sort of your, your method. Well, you see, I'm being judged by somebody there on a very 3D level. Yes. What they're doing is looking at the 3D activity um, and trying to understand that from a purely earthbound human perspective. What they don't understand is the energetic stuff that is going on in the background. And that's really good because they don't want people to know what's going on in the background. That's the whole point of it. Um, What will happen will happen on a 3D level. Um, People have to become used to an idea before they can be moved to the next idea. They become used to that, you then move them on to the next idea. That's perfectly fine. Um, but there are other elements to what I do, which are on an energetic level, which um, cannot be measured by the system that most people know. Well, let me say, though, that I, I mean, I can see that it's, it, it would seem that you're a, a sort of an experiment. 
that it, you know on planet Earth. That the idea of having uh, a person who has a political trajectory in like what the mainstream more or less, who has the ET, you know, the acknowledged publicly known ET connection background with these two races, who are um, you know. Well, at least one of them, the reptilians, have quite a very bad reputation out there. In other words, having you come forward, having you demonstrate trustworthiness in the public eye, so to speak, and then going to the next step. In other words, because at this point, we have Obama in office who does have, um, you know, links with e ancient Egypt, as you may know, and, uh, and, and seems to also have links with an ET sort of, this is from my perspective perhaps, maybe not in, obviously in the mainstream, but it's very easy for people who are in this sector to look at Obama and see that he is being used by certain groups of ETs to do what he's doing, and that he's not just reporting to human humans, but that also has an ET quotient. And in your case, you would be sort of like the next step from an Obama-type individual, where all of that is still covert, you know what I mean? But in your case, this, some of this knowledge is, is going to be out in the public. Because, as you say, you're, you've been voted into office. They know your background. And so that's, you know, in a sense, that's another form of disclosure, is moving a person through the ranks um, visibly, so to speak. Well, you know what, I think it's the best thing is that it's uh, an indictment of how wonderful humanity can be because it can make a choice. Um, it can make a choice not out of fear, right. but a choice out of inclusion. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they voted for me, you know, full of all the background was. Um, 20 years ago that wouldn't have happened. Maybe 10 years ago it wouldn't have happened because the fear, the lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding would have kept people from putting their vote next to my name. Okay. That hasn't happened. So from, from the first point of view, I would say that that actually shows how far the human race has developed and shows the possibility of them becoming more open to accepting and working and understanding with off-worlders. Again, though, the question is very related to 3D and uh, I said we have to get away from that to some extent. We are not just dealing with a 3D earthbound situation. You use the word experiment. Um, you're correct in the word experiment, but you're incorrect in your terminology because you looked at it as a 3D experiment. There Not necessarily, but okay. Okay, 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 all right. There are a number of experiments taking place mm -hmm. around the Earth at the moment in a non-physical sense to see if reptilian culture can live side by side with human culture. Mm -hmm. Can the reptilians give up their idea that they're the gods? Can they give up the idea that they have the right to eat whoever they want? Can they come to a point where they could work with humanity? And can the human race, I don't mean earthbound humans, I mean all of the human races, the more pure humans, can they actually accept a living situation with these creatures? Right. Because if they can, then when humanity evolves, it will take other races with it to the next level. And, sure. And if that can occur, then the effect, and you used the word earlier today about ripple effect. Mm -hmm. the ripple effect throughout the multiverses would be so beneficial that it would actually be a healing source for just about everything. So we have a number of experiments taking place mm -hmm. in different places on the planet. And um, my, I've always said this, Kerry, I'm not important at all. I'm really not important. Mm -hmm. There's nothing important about me at all. Okay? I've always made that clear. Mm -hmm. um, what I am is a person who has experienced these creatures and has just been honest and just gone out there and said to people, you know what, this is the truth. You either buy into it or you don't. And if you don't, maybe in five years' time you will. Mm -hmm. So I'll be around then and we'll talk about it. So if people can vote for me because they think that I'm a good guy, you can help them sort out their problems. And the fact that I have interaction with aliens isn't a problem for them, then humanity is advancing. That's what I want to see. I want to see humanity advancing, not standing still, not going backwards. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, and I appreciate you're taking the time here, and I don't want to keep you too long. Um, 
but uh, you know there are other avenues we can go down. Uh, so in terms of the the races that are out there, and and you know when I mentioned the raptors mm -hmm. that Mark uh, you know Richards is dealing with, um, and he says that they have a, a, a relationship with the Air Force that's pretty pretty strong, um, as well as the Navy to some degree. And so what happens is, uh, uh, what I guess uh, I've been told that, the, that there are two races of reptilians actually here on Earth that want to take over the planet, that kind of consider themselves the ruling, rulers of the planet, not just one. So there are different, perhaps different uh, racial lines and I'm not sure what the distinction is between the two, so that's one part of the question. Um, but also that, that the mantids and the reptilians are working together. Now I don't know if the mantids are working with both groups, the reptilians, or just one of them. And that they are the enemies, uh, how, is how it's put, I think, uh, with the raptors. And that the raptors are aligning themselves with humans because they have seen their future and what uh, Mark Richards says, has seen that in aligning themselves with humans, they have a positive future for their race, uh, and which sounds very similar to what you're saying in regard to the mantids, and possibly a group of rep reptilians as well. So that being the case, how does it play out for you in, as I've described it? Would you describe it the same way, or would you, coming from a mantid perspective, how do you view the raptors, for example? Um, let's go back a little bit onto the question. There was so much in that question. Of all the questions you've asked me, this is the one with the most um, facets that can come from that. If anybody wanted to take over the earth, they'd have done it. Mm -hmm. However, there is some magic which says that you have to let the indigenous population give you the earth. You can't just go and take it. You have to be given it. So the raptors are working to ensure that humanity gives it to them as a present. Therefore, it's theirs to keep. The Air Force like the Raptors because they have a personal relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Let's go back a little bit more. The Earth is, for want of, is a prison planet, for want of a better word. It is a prison planet. Um, the vast majority of the reptilian groups here want to keep the status quo, and they've worked tirelessly to maintain the status quo. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. The next question which could confuse people is, are the mantids and the reptiles uh, working together? Yes, they are. Uh, they have an overall goal, but within that, the mantids have their own agenda. Um, and the way I liken this is, if you imagine some oil was found in the sea and the Americans provided the boat for it, and then the, the Germans provided the optics and the British, the crew. So all countries joined together to exploit this natural resource. So they all agreed, but when they actually got to the resource, they disagreed. So what happened a very, very, very long time ago was that a number of alien groups sat around a table, for want of a better word, and agreed the policy towards humanity. But as things moved on, as 2012 approached and came through, and as it became clearer, some of those groups decided that they didn't want to be part of this anymore, and that they would follow their own agenda. However, when you make an agreement, you make an agreement. And so you have to find ways within that agreement of changing outcomes. And so that's what's occurring at the moment. So you have a group of reptilians who are very well known to many people in America who wish to keep the status quo. You have groups like raptors, there are many other groups who um, are advising small elements of individual influential people. And their goal is to get them to somehow give them the earth on a plate because they're not strong enough to take it themselves. And then you have other groups who want to see humanity free, but the whole rider here is that the DNA in humans is changing on an energetic level. Mm -hmm. It cannot be stopped, this process cannot be stopped, so it's about damage limitation from these people's point of view. How can humans evolve yet they still be prisoners? How can that occur? And that is what the game is about now, and if it can't, well, then there are some mad people out there who will say, well, if we can't have the planet, we'll destroy it. Right. Yes. So that, that, is, that is the ball game that's being played. And mm -hmm. when people talk about a war, they don't understand it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a physical war. There's an energetic war. There's a war of planning, counter-planning, plotting, yes. um, second-guessing that takes place 24-7. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, I talked about, I don't know if you saw the little presentation I did about the CERN the Hadron Collider. You saw that one? Uh, no, I don't think so. I heard you speak of it in your yeah, presentation. Was, Here are bits and pieces. Well, that was the um, particle accelerator that was built yes. on the borders between France and, and sure. Switzerland. And it was designed to operate on 21st of December. Um, and that wouldn't have been a very good thing. And at the time I was writing on Project Avalon, um, saying to people that um, I was very concerned about this. And somebody had found a clip on YouTube and said, there's someone talking exactly as you are. And it was a guy uh, who can trace a lineage back to the Mayan kings, who was going around South America, placing some very sacred objects and all the hidden pyramids in the jungles. Because he'd said that if the CERN device operates over that, it will prevent humans from ascending. That was his terminology. Yes, I actually wrote an article about that and I featured it on my website. I haven't seen that. Yeah, it was, well, it was back in those days when okay. that was going on. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I didn't know this guy, but he was what we'd call, and you guys would call a backstop. Uh -huh. So if the device operated successfully, he was the fallback man. Um, and it was very clear to me that this machine wasn't particularly beneficial to humanity. And so it didn't work on the 21st of December. And I use on my displays, my, my lectures, I have a screenshot from their computers showing that it actually shut down and didn't operate over the crucial period. Well, I, the Wingmaker's material did allude to, to this. They called it blank slate technology. Okay. And, um, and, and I've also heard you mention, uh, so, but I'll say it here, is that you have also said it's not over. They're still using CERN and they're still like working at it. No, it's, it's Japan now. The but, Olympia, the Olympia, okay, they got you Japan. say it's moved to Japan. No, it's still there, but they are building another one in okay. Japan. Right. They have to have up and running before the beginning of 2016. It's okay. called the Linear Collider, it's in excess of $10 billion. And Japan were told if they didn't build it, they'd have another earthquake and they'd go under the water. So they have no choice but to build it. Right. The Linear Collider also is their last chance to open a gate to receive in supplies or reinforcements or to escape. Um, and it'd be very interesting to see what happens there. And I'd also mentioned Bluffdale, um, the data gathering service. Yes. And um, you may be aware that they had a ribbon cutting ceremony on the 29th of September last year and just before the ribbon cutting ceremony there was a big power outage and they had to cancel everybody and all their loyal Americans who were going to come and stand there and clap while they cut the ribbons had to be quietly told, sorry you can't come here. This is the best way to send messages to those who have power, to take out a massive facility. Nobody died, nobody got hurt, mm -hmm. no damage was done. They were just non-operational for a number of hours. And that's the message to say, if you want your radar shut down, if you want your missiles, your whole defence system taken out, nobody's going to die, but that can happen. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful when you make decisions. So these are the sort of things that, that occur, and, and this is what I mean by not looking at things that I do or others do in a 3D way. It's, there's a war going on, um, unlike in Ukraine, that's not a war. There's no war going on in Ukraine. It's a group of rebels fighting a political battle, that's not a war. To the people who died and are killed, it is a war. That's a tragedy on every, every human who dies is a tragedy. But from the planet's perspective, from the political perspective, neither the Americans nor the Russians consider that a war. Okay, well, fair enough. Uh, although, you know, when, when I'm talking and when we are talking here as humans, we're, we're also using terminology so that the people listening to this will understand. So, Please understand that when I ask you a question, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I, I on fully, many levels. I, I fully understand that, yeah. but I want the audience to realize that the powers that be do not consider it a war. Yes, I'm and, and that's it. valuable. I mean, this is, the, you know, understanding one's uh, adversary is, is, is really a very important part of, you know, yes. so, um, for what it's worth. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. I mean, it's, it is very interesting, this uh, relationship that we've got going on here in the planet. Uh, now, we did, you did reference the Chinese, uh, and you did also, I, I want to talk about that, but there was something you said last night um, in the, on the panel, okay. and you referenced uh, that an event that was coming, or something that was coming, 
and you said that the Illuminati were right now sending, I, I think the way you termed it was, you know, vitamins and such things to bloodlines that are, and I got kind of like that, uh, maybe in the Eastern Bloc, that, uh, you know, poor or more poverty-stricken areas to sort of prepare these people and to get them prepared for a, uh, a coming event or a coming downturn or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure. You sort of reference something. And what I'm asking you basically, what were you referencing and when? Often I'll drop seeds out into an audience and hopefully they'll go and do their own research. Mm -hmm. um, Eastern Bloc, because land is cheap, labor is cheap, people can be bribed in the Eastern Bloc, things can be done, questions don't get asked. That's why these are being built in the Eastern Bloc. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very useful place for a multi-millionaire or a billionaire to operate. Right. And if you're part of the European Union, it gives you access without question to no, no borders. Yes. So there are a number of old Eastern Bloc countries which are now part of the European Union where factories are being set up to just literally supply in vitamin enriched food, fluids, which will be sold, they won't be given away free, but to bloodline families, not a lot of them, or supporters or employees of the Illuminati. Right. So if there is a situation where good quality food is very hard to get hold of, where good quality drinking water is very hard to get hold of, these families and groups will have access to uh, a source of nutrition that will allow them to maintain their own personality. Um, that is being set up and the young woman who was with me in the car when we were sort of crashed into um, is now working on that project. Okay, but the event that you're referencing, or whatever it is, um, do you want to go well, down we, that road? Yeah, to an extent, because we talked <clears> about <throat> uh, CERN, so we talked about other things. Yeah. The, the year 2016 is an important point because it marks um, the cutoff point at which certain groups on Earth can receive through portals. Uh, it's the last chance to renegotiate or re-establish a link. After that point, it would be very difficult for them to do so. And so any event that has to occur from their perspective will have to occur before that. Um, yeah, I, I'd be quite open with you because what the heck is the point of me talking to you if I'm not going to give you warnings? And, you know, um, the Americans have devised a electromagnetic pulse device which can be piloted from a drone. Mm -hmm. um, and I would suggest that New York could be taken out with an electromagnetic pulse. You have something like 30 huge generators in America. We don't have them in this country, it's such a small country, but in America you have to force the electric juice thousands of miles through the grid, the network system, and you have 30, three zero huge devices to do that. The repair time is between one year and two years to replace these things. And my information is that you need to take out three. That's all, three, simultaneously and you will plunge North America into an ice age, electronically. But as all the money is electronic now, that's how you would do that. So that's a very serious plan. Mm -hmm. um, I know people keep talking about, we're going to wipe out 70% of the population, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Technology's moved on to such an extent, it's not actually necessary to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You can control people through many other ways. You don't have to put them up and guillotine their heads off. Um, th I believe those were all true. I believe people sat around tables 20 years ago and said, this is what we're going to do. But then as technology moved and we can put RFID chips into people, we can control their bank accounts, we can actually control the way they think. Why do we need to kill them? All these lovely little robots for us. Yes. So the, the thinking has changed at that level. Mm -hmm. However, there is this, this mad, and I'm using the word, this mad group in that either want to detonated dirty nuclear bomb, we have the size of a suitcase, perhaps smaller, briefcase. That's a very serious plan. And we've had two attempts to detonate a nuclear bomb in America over the last 10 to 15 years, which have both been thwarted by good, loyal Americans. And I'm using their term back on them, because those are the good, loyal Americans. They're mostly men, but some women, who are not prepared to kill thousands of people because somebody's got some power play that's going on. And this is where the, 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 the problem for this elite is that most of the American are good humans. 
and won't go along with this. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is the potential for a dirty bomb to be exploded in, in a North American city as a final attempt. But before that, I would expect an electromagnetic pulse to try and take down the economic base. And the point of that is it, Britain, London is the financial hub for the clearinghouse. You can't ever do it to London because the Queen lives there. But you can do it to America. And so that is, that is the game that's afoot at the moment. Okay. Well, <clears throat> our witness, uh, Arthur Neumann is his real name, but Henry Deacon at the time came out really almost seven years ago now talking about this. Um, EMP, right. um, and that it would be flown in a plane, okay. and that it would be America doing it to itself, right. so in right. essence. Plane now would be a drone. Yeah, yeah, but back in those days, or at least his reference. Sure. I don't think even drones were talked about back there. Okay. Uh, although I'm sure he knew that part of it too because of his background. Um, yeah, I mean, he, you know, so so what you're saying is, um, <clears throat> sorry. Bless you is something that we were aware of at Camelot and that we did put out there through him and his testimony. Uh, I think back in those days, people didn't pay close attention to that. It's interesting that time has moved on now and this is talked about even by politicians. Uh, they're actually going, seeding you know, the information out saying, you know, so that they can say, I told you so. No, hopefully we're doing it to change the timeline. Okay, well, yes, that's, that's the doing. better side of it. Yeah, because okay. by saying it, um, then the attitude is, well, okay, our game has been called, our bluff has been called, right. we can't do that anymore. That's well, this is doing. absolutely why we reveal testimony, why yes. we reveal all the things we reveal. Sure. We're trying to uh, expose them, expose them to the light of day, so to speak. Yes. And, um, and that's what this is all about. That's and great. I assume this is yes. yeah, what you're doing as well. Sure. So, all right, well... Um, I think we could spend many hours here, and I hope that this has been of interest to you so that we could perhaps do this at another time. I have a radio show on Revolution. It's a weekly radio show. Um, and I also do live streams, so bit, bit with the time difference when I'm in America, um, we could possibly, you know, do some more Q&A. And I that think that nice. this, will, this will generate quite a bit of interest out there, and um, we'll see, you know, what okay. comes of it. So but Whatever you want to do is fine. All right. All right, thank you very much, and thank you for your service to humanity.